Hey everyone, and welcome back to Exposing SMG. I'm back with another episode recap on Harry and Meghan's soap opera of a Netflix show. I gotta say guys, volume two really did stoop lower than expected, and now there are reports of them wanting an apology from the royal family? You want an apology from the family you've been publicly trashing? <sighs> anyway, if you guys are new here, be sure to like and subscribe for more content. I already did a recap on the first three episode and exposed all the lies that were said in each episode, so be sure to check those videos out, share this video if you like it, and without further ado, here's the episode 4 recap and three lies they said. As always, there are video chapters available. They start off with Meghan talking about a high-ranking member of staff telling her that her marrying into the royal family is like this fish that is swimming perfectly, powerful, it's on the right current, and one day this little organism comes in, this foreign organism, and the entire thing goes, eee, what is that? What is it doing here? It doesn't look like us, it doesn't move like us, we don't like it, get it off of us. That's how Meghan recaps her entrance into the royal family and then went on to say that she was told that they'll soon see that this little organism, it's stronger and faster and better with this organism as part of it. And it will be hard at the beginning for them to adjust to this new thing, but then it will be amazing. The self-praise and self-grandeur here are impeccable. And it's funny because throughout the episodes, all six, yes, I sat through that misery, all they do is use headlines that inflate Megan's ego saying how she's a fresh breath of air, the monarchy needed her, and so on. And it's funny because they only complain about the headlines when they aren't in their favor, but they have no problem abusing positive headlines about Meghan to inflate her already huge ego. And James Holt, one of their mouthpieces, does the same praise of Meghan that he does in every episode, talking about how she's modern, the new generation of people, and so on. They then talk about the wedding and how calm Meghan was and how Harry was like there was a big expectation to have a big wedding because he's Diana's boy. Meanwhile, I'm pretty sure they could have had a small wedding if they wanted to and they didn't have to spend over 30 million dollars of the British taxpayer money. Also there was a report back in the day saying that because it would be Meghan's second wedding it didn't have to be big. It was actually Meghan who wanted an over the top veil, who threw a fit about wanting a specific kind of tiara, who got into an argument with Kate Middleton over bridesmaid dresses. So it doesn't seem like they wanted a small wedding. Also, Meghan's veil was very over the top and compared to the Queen's veil at her coronation, especially with the embroidered flowers from each Commonwealth country. Only for Meghan to call the Commonwealth racist and that it's a British Empire 2.0 in episode 3 which I already exposed. Of course, it was one of her mouthpieces talking. Also, the veil is compared to Princess Diana's veil. Harry's then like, look at what I got, look at what I found. And it's like, Harry darling, she found you. This random friend Vicky is like, the whole world paused and celebrated a moment of love because no duh, that's what happens at all weddings. Meghan then calls Charles charming and Harry states multiple times that Charles went out of his way to help them with this over the top wedding, stating that Charles helped them choose a great orchestra and how he helped them put together a gospel choir, getting the most incredible singers from each choir and coining them into one, which doesn't seem like an easy task. And Charles was like, oh yeah, that's a great idea, that's a great idea, yeah, yeah. So much for a racist family, right? One thing these two privileged bozos are gonna do is complain. I remember Megan complaining about Frogmore Cottage and mentioning that on Oprah to the point where they spent over three million dollars on renovations only to pay it back after public outrage because they spent all that money only to later leave. And now they complain that Nottingham Cottage was so small and Harry said that there were low ceilings and Megan was like Harry would hit his head constantly. They said that the reality of living in Nottingham Cottage sounds like a palace, but it wasn't for them. Harry says, as far as people were concerned, we were living in a palace and we were in a cottage. Megan then stepped in to clarify to say it was in palace grounds. Is it just me or does this not sound bad whatsoever? Megan then says that Kensington Palace sounds very regal, but Nottingham Cottage was so small. She also says that it was a chapter in their lives where no one could believe what it was actually like behind the scenes. I'm sorry, but am I missing the part where I'm supposed to give them sympathy? Oh, poor you, Megan. Who could imagine what it's like living in a cottage that's very fancy and extremely well designed while there are people living on the streets? 
And Megan is of course documenting everything and recording every little bit of her life. She name drops Oprah and is like, when Oprah came over, she was like, no one would ever believe it. About how small the cottage is and then Megan and Harry keep repeating that same phrase in the same tone that I just said, which I'm not going to insert because it's so annoying, it could actually send anyone into cardiac arrest. Now what's hilarious is that Prince Harry failed to mention that he moved into Nottingham Cottage in 2013 and deemed it his bachelor pad. Did the ceilings not bother him then? Also, William and Catherine lived there along with Prince George before they moved into Kensington Palace. The fact that Harry and Meghan were making it sound like they were oppressed because poor them, the two bedroom 1300 square feet cottage that they lived in for a few months, only temporary, wasn't enough for them, but the future king and queen of England lived there and never complained. It really puts things into perspective. Meghan talks again about how her first royal engagement with the queen and how it was a great time, how incredible the queen was, how warm and loving, the blanket on her knee, all of that. The same thing that she stated on Oprah. And what many people don't know is that the queen took Meghan in and treated her like her own because she was special to Harry. She invited her to sing to him Christmas before Harry and Meghan were married, something that wasn't done before, and she did a royal engagement with her before the wedding. Again, something that is not common. Not to mention everything Charles did for them with the wedding. So it's very interesting how they continue to vilify the same people who made them relevant and were family to both of them. Megan then talks about the Grenfell fire and how she befriended ladies at a local mosque, did a cookbook with them, and how she loved that so much. First of all, I remember reading the headlines about this and the headlines weren't bad the way the episode made it seem to say that Megan was in touch with terrorists. And even then, what a nasty thing to say. I'm not condoning that behavior by the media by any means. And second of all, it was lovely to see Meghan work hand in hand with the Muslim community. It was beautiful. But the only thing I didn't like was how the segment was used in the episode. It was very two-faced and braggy to the point where Afua is like, what's not to like about Meghan? And it was basically Meghan saying, look at me, look at what I'm doing and you still hate me. It really read off like she wanted the praise more than anything else. And that put a really sour taste in my mouth. I'm sorry that people are so jealous of me, but I can't help it that I'm popular. Oh my god! The funniest part was Harry saying that everyone is threatened by how popular both he and Meghan were, which again contradicts everything. Were you guys so popular or so hated? Make it make sense. They say that the Australian tour changed everything because it was very successful, and they insert endless media clips talking about how they are the superstars of the family, they speak effortlessly, and all of this praise. And of course, Meghan and Harry continue suffocating us with the ultra-personal photos coming from the very same two that whine about privacy every hour. Harry then says that on the Australian tour, they had to announce Meghan was pregnant because Meghan was showing. She really wasn't. I think they just wanted to announce it and wanted the attention. Meghan was then like, it was such a rigorous tour. And I just want to know, are Meghan and Harry aware that women who are pregnant work long, long hours, whether in a school, corporate office, or whatever else, up until they're like seven or eight months pregnant? The fact that Meghan was pregnant for like three months and all she did was walk around and talk to people for a few hours a day, like all she did was ever complain. She was never once happy or content and that's why people feel like she's out of touch with reality. They then bring in Meghan's two random friends who are probably getting a paycheck and they're like, I don't understand what happened and they were so popular because apparently at this point the media turned on them. Um, I don't know, maybe it had to do with the fact that there were multiple stories of how nasty Meghan treated people on the Australian tour, going as far as allegedly throwing hot tea on a staff member, and supposedly the palace paid the person off to keep quiet. Do you guys want a video on the Australian tour from hell? Let me know. Harry then claimed that the palace was threatened that both he and Meghan were stealing the limelight and doing better than the ones who were born for this role, once again throwing shade at William and Catherine. He was like, Megan would be on the front pages and victim Megs tells him, it's not my fault. And Harry was like, I know, my mom felt the same way. Then they show a clip of Diana talking about the media attention and saying that people are jealous. My man, go to therapy. You claim that you don't even remember who your mom was and here you are constantly talking about how your weirdo American wife is the exact carbon copy of your mother? My God, Sigmund Freud, wake up. You definitely want to assess this. They then show a headline of the Queen blasting Meghan for her diva behavior and they claim that the royal family wanted to make them irrelevant because this was destabilizing power imbalances. 
First of all, I don't think the palace was threatened by their popularity. Why would they hate something that makes them look good? Second of all, William and Catherine have been married for over a decade now. Their time to shine already happened when they were the new shiny thing. They were everywhere. It was an entire craze for them worldwide, including America. And it was such a craze to the point where Harry's professional cosplayer for his mother, also known as his wife, wrote about Catherine on her blog. It's normal for Meghan and Harry to be the current trending topic when their story was new. You can't compare their popularity to a couple that has already been around and has already gotten all the praise and glory. But explaining logic to Meghan and Harry is like talking to a wall. Also, no one was jealous of them. If anything, Harry and Meghan are projecting because people like William and Catherine were more loved because they treated people nicely. And there were multiple reports that it was actually Meghan who was jealous of Catherine and how she had to walk behind her and be like second fiddle to her. And yes, there were multiple reports that the Queen had to tell Meghan to pipe down because they don't speak to people like this and none of the bullying reports have been disproved. Meghan and Harry just claim that everyone on earth is out to get them, which yeah, totally makes sense that everyone else is the problem and not you, the common denominator. Harry, who then gossips like a girl and is the mouthpiece for his wife, talks about the media comparison between Kate and Meghan with the avocado, the baby bumps, the off-the-shoulder dress, and then blames, what do you guys think he blamed it on? Racism. First of all, it's very common to compare two people in the same field, and sometimes the media is unfair to one, and that depends on public image. This can be heavily seen in multiple examples. As someone who runs a celebrity blog, I can give you like 30 million examples of it happening to people of all color, mainly white celebrities, and men and women. And this was heavily seen in the Miley Cyrus versus Selena Gomez debate where Miley was called a slut for one thing, but Selena was praised for breaking boundaries for another. Why? Selena had a more wholesome image in the media, so they sympathized with her more in comparison to Miley, who was more of the wild child. So it's a normal comparison and it was a raindrop in the ocean. Not all the articles were like that, but of course leave it to them to complain about everything and focus and pick out the 1% bad. Harry then talks about racism and the n-word again and thank you to former Nazi cosplayer for educating us. Also, wasn't Harry throwing slurs at Pakistani officers back in his military days? But go off Professor Ethics, educate us. Megan then repeats what we already saw in the last three episodes and complains about the tabloids again, then gets mad that someone told her in person that what she's doing to her father isn't right, and then she goes on this whole tangent of, oh my god, people believe this stuff? The tabloids? Girl, shut up. People hate you for what you did to your father based on what your father said about you, not the media. She's so dense for someone who's supposedly a brainy nerd. Harry then talks about his mom again. They show a picture of Diana crying at one royal engagement, and then of course they cut to Meghan looking sad at another to draw the comparisons, failing to mention that Meghan looking sad was at Remembrance Day in 2019, so obviously it would be inappropriate to be smiling. But again, you can't preach to someone who wants his wife to be his modern day mommy. Meghan then talks again about how she didn't want to live because it was too much for her, and Doria is like, this broke my heart, and Harry said that he dealt with it as institution Harry and not husband Harry. But instead of taking accountability for his own actions, he blames his training for a royal role and fearing what people are gonna think. God forbid Harry can put on his leader pants. Again, we heard this story on Oprah. They refused to tell us who denied Meghan this supposed help because if the story is true, then they shouldn't have such a reckless individual working at the palace. But of course they can't name anyone. They just want to cry about the palace not ruining their image with mental health, despite the fact that the future Queen of England, Catherine Middleton, is very vocal about mental health and her family struggles, and the fact that Catherine, William, and Harry all founded a mental health company together. But tell me more about how no one wanted to get your wife help. What's disheartening to see here is the toxic imbalances of their relationship, because Harry says that he hates himself for it, and that what she needed from me was so much more than I was able to give. And this is so, so, so toxic that he even blames her own struggles on himself. And it kind of gives me the impression that's because she blames her struggles on him. I do feel for him, especially because on Oprah, she told him that she wants to take her life while pregnant with their baby, but she's not gonna actually do it, but she just wanted to let him know. I don't know about you, but in my opinion, this classifies as emotional abuse. Threatening something you know you're not gonna do, just for what? so you control the same person who loves you and keep them little in your shadow, it's incredibly disheartening. Also, it sounds like they should go to therapy instead of airing their personal laundry to millions on Netflix.
Harry keeps contradicting himself because he keeps saying that he was told they can't control the media and yet claims that his brother was leaking stories about him, but not one journalist stands with him. Crybaby Harry said, no one would have convos with the media to say enough. And Charles told him, my darling boy, you can't take on the media. The media will always be the media, which is true. Does Harry have worms for brains? You are almost 40 trying to censor the media. He was like, I fundamentally disagree because the media is briefed in on other members of the family. Favors are called and it's a dirty game. He says he confronted his family and they were like, are you suggesting I condone this? And Harry was like, no, but have you done anything to stop it? And like, what doesn't this idiot get? The royal family can't stop stories from breaking out, especially if there are multiple, multiple, multiple sources across the world reporting on it. He wants to talk about the royal rota, but I can list 90 million other sites from the US, Australia, other international sites in India, the Middle East, exposing things that the UK media didn't expose yet. So then he accuses his family of leaking, but also planting stories. He claims that they will remove one negative story and trade to give you a different negative story, and that he and William had a promise that their offices won't do what his father's office did to his mother, but that didn't happen. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more towards the lies portion towards the end of the video, but it's funny how he's talking about promises being broken, but he continues to use Diana's Panorama interview where she was kind of manipulated into giving the interview and William wanted it locked down. No one can use it because he doesn't want to see his vulnerable mother being used in front of millions of people and he had Harry and Meghan kind of unlock that footage from a vault that was never supposed to be given and apparently sold the rights to Netflix. And here they are showing us constant clips in every episode. And on top of that, I think it's funny how Harry thinks that there's a big conspiracy against Meghan and thousands of people in the media are in on it. But the truth is, sweetie, you are just not that likable. James Holt then said that for one Christmas party, it felt like two parties and separate groups. Oh my god, breaking news, you realize parties break up into different social circles. Wow, please keep spilling the tea. Megan then says that everything was so controlled to the point where she couldn't even text her friends a photo. Right, right. You have the privilege of flying to New York City for a lavish baby shower, but you can't text your friends. Kind of reminds me of that time she claimed the palace took away their passports on Oprah, even though she was seen jetting off all around the world. Who even believes her? The fact that she's also complaining about the media said about the baby shower three years later is so funny to me. Like your mom wasn't even present about that, but that's what you're upset about. This level of censorship is wild. Back in the day, Megan couldn't help her recruit five of her friends to give an exclusive story about her to People magazine. Her friend is like, oh, I knew the editor of the magazine. Oh, what a coincidence. And they claim they wanted to do it from the goodness of their heart. Sure. He wanted to go against a protocol that royals don't speak to the media and talk to the media to give Meghan's side of the story. Now, the funny part is they don't deny that Meghan orchestrated this, but they don't elaborate on it either. I just remember Meghan being in shambles over the male filing to get their identities revealed because the People magazine was at the heart of a privacy claim. So you can't have your five friends speak about your father and reveal private details, then cry privacy, which is why the male was like, okay, well, let's unveil the identities. This is also the reason that Thomas ended up giving the letter to the mail to defend himself, but that's elaborated on more in episode 5. The Queen ends up offering them Frogmore Cottage, which is a huge property with over 5,000 square feet, and Meghan and Harry share a bunch of different intimate photos because they're the private royals after all. They show us the sonogram, them on the steps moving in, and so much more. And again, who took these spontaneous photos? Or did you guys have a professional photographer hired at all time? Megan then talks about the pressure of taking a picture on the steps after giving birth, which is a royal tradition. If you guys are realizing a theme, it's that Megan has a complaint with everything. She gave birth at a different hospital than everyone else, which made it harder to provide security measures for her to do the photo op. And it was a little hard for her to travel back to where the photo was usually taken. And she said that no one from the palace was upset about this and she wanted to come up with a compromise, which no one said no about. So there's no problem, right? The palace was like, yeah, 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 sure, good idea. We'll do whatever you want. But the media at the time was reporting on how this was different and they're not doing the usual tradition, which again, normal. Some people had a fit because they wanted to see Archie and of course Meghan and Harry had to show us those few headlines as opposed to what was going on overall. Then they cry about getting abuse for not serving up their child on a silver platter. Speaking of serving your child on a silver platter, why are you guys showing us sonogram photos, photos of Archie in the bath, a bunch of different videos of Archie running around and playing? 
You guys didn't want to give one or two photos to the media, but you have no problem giving us a whole documentary of both Archie and Lilibet's life before either of them are old enough to formulate thoughts? There's a bunch of videos of Archie talking to Megan and saying mommy, but mommy is too busy shoving a camera in his face to actually be present in the moment with her son. I can't get over the amount of intimate photos they serve in the soap opera, but yet again they have the gallbladder to complain about giving the palace one professional portrait to share. They are literal hypocrites who are so unlikable. They then bring in Archie's nanny, Lauren, who was under fire after Megan claims that Archie's nursery went on fire in South Africa, and she's like, Megan and Harry, there is no formality with them, and Harry was barefoot when he met her, and it's all these little details that are supposed to show us how quirky and lovable and normal Harry and Meghan are in comparison to the cold William and Catherine. And anyone who can't see through their bowl has to look harder, to be honest. Meghan then complains that the media had a reaction to her, but no one asks me if I'm okay comment while on tour in Africa. And first of all, people have a right to call her out for her out of touch statement when she's visiting those living in poverty, but has the audacity to be like, but no one asked if I'm okay. You're there on a job. Be professional for once in your privileged life. She then kind of throws the interviewer under the bus because she was like, I was so exhausted. My makeup wasn't touched up. I didn't even know they were going to use my answer in the documentary. Like girl, you are well aware a documentary was being filmed. Enough with the victim narrative. Harry then says something which, come on guys, guess what he says? No one in the family speaks that openly except for one person, my mum. Sigmund Freud, please wake up. In conclusion, Harry needs therapy, Meghan needs to let people have an opinion and a reaction, and both of these two bozos have to understand that no one is going to blindly praise you. I already exposed their lies throughout the video because their entire story quite frankly had holes in it, but I know you guys like the list format, so here are three lies they said in episode 4. Lie number 1. The palace was leaking and planting stories. It's funny how there is no proof that anyone in the palace leaked or planted stories about them, but there's proof about Meghan and Harry leaking and planting stories about themselves and everyone. They try to discredit Jason Knopf later on in the series, but the truth of the matter is Harry is on record writing an email saying, I totally agree that we have to be able to say we didn't have anything to do with finding freedom. Is that not leaking and planting stories to finding freedom, which is covered by the press? How about when Megan had to apologize in court because she was actually the one planting stories and she purposely misled the court? Not to mention everything I already exposed in other videos about her planting paparazzi photos and so much more. Prince William split the household with the Queen's approval and it was proven in court by Jason Knopf that Megan used Kensington Palace staff to leak her propaganda. So no, Kensington Palace did not brief against Meghan and Harry, they actually used Kensington Palace to brief the media. So who are we going to believe? Court proof that Meghan had to apologize for? Or the fairies in Meghan's head telling her that the palace leaked stories about her? Also, Kensington Palace lied several times to protect Meghan, but they won't tell you that. Lie number two. Those who live in Nottingham Cottage are so short. Now, I already talked about this throughout the video, but I want to elaborate on one thing. Harry claims that he doesn't know who lived at Nottingham Cottage before him, but they must have been short because the ceilings are so low. I didn't know Catherine, who is 5'9", and William, who is 6'3", are considered short. Again, with the lies and propaganda. And Harry playing dumb is also such a cowardly move. Like, what are you trying to prove here? free real estate in central London, and they managed to complain. Look at Nottingham Cottage and tell me more about how small it is for two people. Nottingham Cottage is too small, and the governor's mansion in South Africa was a housing unit. You will never be able to please someone like Meghan who aims to find trouble. Lie number three, no evidence of a royal contract. Richard Palmer, who works as a royal correspondent for almost 19 years now, said, I have seen no evidence of the mythical contract Harry and Meghan claim exists between the press and the palace to favor one part of the family over another. Now I'm going to read part of his statement because it's worth it. He says, The contract, such as it exists, is the same as for any politician or other public figure. You want the media to cover you, but don't expect the coverage always to be positive. Everyone makes mistakes, and if you are in public life, you should expect criticism every now and again. Few monarchs or members of the family have been universally popular down the centuries. It's a national soap opera and media coverage often reflects public opinion about them. 
Harry and Meghan were hugely popular but lost the support of the British public because of their actions. It was they who broke the unwritten contract between the royal family and the British public by wanting all the benefits of being part of the firm without the sacrifices that go with it. Even before the wedding, stories were leaking about how unpleasant they were to work for and to deal with. That wasn't because there was a concerted plot against them directed by the powers that be. It was just what happens if you are part of a large organization where it becomes widely known that your behavior is appalling. They were no better at dealing with some of us outside the royal household. If you are rude and unhelpful, is it any wonder that you end up getting bad press? He made some awesome points if I say so myself. Royal correspondent Rhiannon Mills said that in the run-up to the wedding, I took numerous calls where I was briefed by their team that I should make it clear that the couple were being very supportive of Thomas Markle, Meghan's estranged father. Because you guys know, in the episode, Meghan tries to make it seem like the media invented this rift between her father. Meanwhile, it was just the facts and it's stuff that her father did and things that she did as well. Rhiannon Mills also said that she got into huge rows with their team, Meghan and Harry's, if they felt that she stepped out of line. Like that one time that she announced Archie had been born almost 10 minutes before the rest of the media because she'd been told it on the phone and the email to everyone else was still stuck in the system. And the time I tried to ask Harry a question in Malawi, he bit my head off and his team accused me of trying to push him up against the car and suggested I was hounding him like Diana used to be chased. She also said that she was never fed stories by the Cambridges' team. And of course, never forget the time that Katie Hines said that Meghan begged to meet her for drinks to get into the tabloids. She wrote, Keen to make a name in Britain, her UK publicist had all but begged me to meet the actress for a drink. To be honest, I'd never heard of Meghan or Suits, but reluctantly agreed. Here I was on a windswept November night in 2013 sharing a bottle of Prosecco with Prince Harry's future wife, both of us shivering beneath an outdoor heater. It soon became clear that Meghan was determined to raise her profile, even if it was with an inconsensual 80-word piece tagged onto the end of my weekly column. It's also where she told Katie how much she loved London and English men. Katie only spoke up after Meghan was moaning about the press back in 2019. Again, we have names to dispute their claims, real people, and yet Meghan and Harry can't even offer one solid piece of evidence. Instead, they put the lives of journalists on the line as they receive death threats, while Meghan and Harry cry for privacy. Hypocrite losers. Now, I hope you guys enjoyed my recap and me exposing their lies. Please let me know if you want me to continue doing this. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Like and subscribe for more content each week. Follow us on our social media, and as always, I'll see you next time.